Well, good morning. I want to welcome each of you to Hill Country Bible Church, whether you're joining us live at one of our locations or whether you're online. It's just great to be together. And since today kind of marks the beginning of Thanksgiving week, let me be the first to say Happy Thanksgiving to you. Thank you. And let me ask an honesty question. Now, you don't have to answer it out loud or even to the person next to you, but in your heart, how ready are you for your gratitude celebration that's coming in the next four days? Maybe just do a little bit of a heart check. Some of you may be thinking, like, I'm stressed or maybe I'm stretched. Or maybe you're feeling a little bit of despair, kind of a little bit of a hopeless gray cloud kind of hanging over like the weather's been recently. And you're just wondering, like, am I going to be ready four days from now to really truly pour out my gratitude? Now, if you're thinking that, like, how can you be grateful in the world under the conditions that we live? I just want to remind you that the actual national holiday... Thanksgiving Day was established by Abraham Lincoln, and Abraham Lincoln established that day in 1863 um, when we were right in the middle of the Civil War, the Civil War in which which 620,000 people died, leaving behind widows and orphans and a broken nation. And in the middle of that, Abraham Lincoln said, I want all of us, all of the people to come together in one voice and thank the God in heaven with gratitude for what he's blessed us with. Now, Abraham Lincoln also went on in his later writings to describe more of what was in his mind, because Abraham Lincoln actually stated that he believed that the suffering of our nation during the Civil War was God's judgment on us for the sin of slavery. And the bloodshed and the pain of the Civil War was actually God saying, because you've done this to a group of people, this is what you're going to get. Now, That's a pretty strong thing to say, but that's what Lincoln actually wrote in his second inaugural address. Now, that raises another question that I want you to think about. This is more of a thought question. Is it possible to be grateful to a God even when he's bringing judgment into our lives? Is it possible to be grateful to God even when he's bringing judgment into our lives. Now, if you're one of those kind of people who say, yeah, I'm I'm grateful, God, when when you're blessing me, but when things are hard, like, I don't have any reason to be grateful. Like, if you feel that way, I get that. That's actually been one of the big questions that God's people have asked throughout all of history. Like, how can God be good and still be a God who brings judgment for sin and evil? That's like a hard thing for us to get our minds around. And that's what we've been looking at in our study of the book of Ezekiel. So for the past several weeks, we've been looking at this incredible Old Testament book, the book of Ezekiel, and the people of Israel are asking for the glory days. Like, could we go back to the glory days? And the book of Ezekiel said, no, you can't go back there, but the best is yet to come. And many of us feel the same way. We look to a time in the past with nostalgia and think, if we can get back to that, but if you were a follower of Jesus Christ, your best days are in the future. There's something we have to look forward to. Now, a little bit of background on the book of Ezekiel to bring us up to speed. When the nation of Israel was in bondage in Egypt, they were slaves in Egypt, Uh, God came along and delivered them, brought them out of Egypt, and offered them a covenant. He said, I want to offer you a covenant that you can agree to with me. And he laid it out. There was the blessings of obedience. If you obey my laws, you follow my ways, you live in harmony with each other, you treat each other right, and you follow me as your God, then I'll bring blessing on you. He also said, if you reject my ways and you treat each other wrong, you don't follow my decrees, and you don't make me your God, you worship other gods, 
then I'm going to bring judgment on you. And he offered them a choice, and the nation of Israel signed up. They actually said, that sounds like a good deal, and they made a promise to God. But once they got in the promised land that God gave them, and he began to prosper them, and he was with them, all of a sudden, they forgot about what they'd committed to, and they started the selfish walk of rejecting God. And when God started to bring judgment, then they thought, well, God's not doing good enough. And they went out and they invited all the gods of all the nations to be their gods. They started worshiping other things. And finally, after centuries of doing this, God said, I made a promise to you. You made a promise to me. You've broken it. And the judgment is coming. And he brought the nations to take the people into captivity and destroy the land. He appeared to Ezekiel and gave him the, the, the responsibility to prophesy of what was taking place. So Ezekiel's in Babylon with 10,000 political refugees that have been carried into captivity, and he's telling them, God's going to destroy Jerusalem, he's going to destroy the temple, he's going to rid the land of his people. He's going to bring about this judgment because they broke the covenant? And everybody's saying, no, that's never going to happen. And it did happen. In fact, in chapter 33 of Ezekiel, after prophesying for eight years that this was coming, finally somebody arrived from Jerusalem and said, the city's destroyed, the temple's destroyed, and God has brought about his judgment. In chapter 34, then God begins to share something else. He begins to talk about a future blessing, forgiveness, hope, restoration. And when we come to chapter 37, the last in that section of God's hope, we come to the chapter that's the most famous chapter in the book of Ezekiel. So I would invite you to grab your Bibles, open them to Ezekiel chapter 37, and we're going to look at this fantastic chapter today with that history in mind. And what we see in this chapter is what God promises, and that is that death will not have the final say because God can raise the dead. Death will not have the final say because God can raise the dead. Now, in this chapter, the question is, can God resurrect his people? That's the, cha that's the question. Can God resurrect his people? So let's dive in. Chapter 37, verse 1. It's a phenomenal chapter. Ezekiel writes, the hand of the Lord was upon me. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. So this is a vision. God brings Ezekiel, sets him down in the vision in this valley, and the whole valley is just death. Dead bones in the whole valley. My question to you is, when was that moment in your life when death actually became real to you. Like you came face to face and death became real to you. Can you remember that moment? Like I'll never forget my moment. I was in elementary school and there was a, an older boy in our church. He was in middle school who was diagnosed with a brain tumor and over months we prayed for him and so like he was he was doing better and then worse and better and worse and finally my parents told me that he passed away and that we were going to this thing called a funeral and so I'll never forget walking into the funeral home and there were people on both sides sitting there and I wasn't sure what was going on I'm sure my parents explained it to me but I, I didn't remember it and we're walking in, and I realize my dad's actually leading us down toward the front. And as I start walking down toward the front, I realize, oh, there's a casket there. As I got closer and closer, I realized, oh, there's somebody in it. And as I looked, I realized, oh, that's Donald. And it was a surreal moment. I mean, through all that he'd been through, they put a wig on his head because of the surgery. His face, they tried to make it look like it was alive. And so it just didn't even look real to me. And there was a shudder of death that just shook right through my whole body there as a young boy in elementary school. And I realized, oh, this is death. 
this is coming for everyone. This is coming for me. Can you recall the time when it became real to you? Like that moment changed the way I look at life. And hopefully that moment for you changed the way you look at life. This moment begins to change the way Ezekiel will look at everything because he sees this valley of dead bones. And we read in verse 2, he led me back and forth among them. So the Spirit of God is taking him through the valley, and he's experiencing this. And he said, I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. So what's going on here? What happened here? Who are these people? Where did these dead bones come from? Well, we we read in verse 9, these bones are the bodies of slain people. In other words, something catastrophic happened that killed a whole bunch of people. We read that these bones are very dry, so it had happened in the past. And in verse 10, we find out that this was an army. Oh, it's beginning to make sense. And then in verse 11, we actually read the interpretation, and it says, then he said to me, that's God speaking, he said, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Oh, this is the dead, the judgment on the dead in the house of Israel. And he says, they, the bones are speaking, and they say, our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, and we are cut off. And we are cut off. Now, this is profound. What's taking place here is this vision is a representative of the nation of Israel that has been destroyed under the judgment of God as the Assyrian armies marched in and wiped out the ten tribes of the north, and then the Babylonian armies came in and wiped out the two tribes of the south, and this represents the dead. They've been dead for a long time. The bones are dry. And the bones are on the surface of the ground. In other words, there was no place for them to be buried. In fact, as the bones are speaking in verse 11, the bones are saying, we've been cut off. Well, what do you mean cut off? What does that mean? It doesn't just mean death. It means that we have been separated from the blessing of God. In other words, these bones are cursed. Now, if you want to read about what God said would happen, write down Deuteronomy chapter 28 and go read the chapter. It lays out the blessing and the cursing. But in the cursing, God says, if you reject me and you walk away and you go the way of evil, then I will bring the nations who will come in and they will kill you and they will leave you where your bodies will be eaten by the birds of the air and the animals on the ground. In other words, this vision is a fulfillment of the curse. Now, here's the question. Is it possible for somebody who has sinned against God, somebody who is now cursed and dead, is it possible for anything to happen? Now, this is an important question for all of us to ask because some of us may feel like You know, Tim, really, if I was honest in my heart of hearts, I feel like I'm too far gone. Like, I don't think God could ever fix me, take me back. Now, some of you would say, well, you know, if you knew what I did, if if you knew what I did or you knew what was done to me, if you knew that, like, you might be thinking, like, "I, I feel like I'm cursed. It may be something you've said. It actually may be something that you think about that occupies your mind on a regular basis and you think to yourself, whoa, with that stuff going on in here, how could God ever have anything to do with me? That may be what you're thinking. So God actually asks the question. Look at what he says in verse 3. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? Is it possible for God to do something with these people after what they've done and what's happened to them. His response, Ezekiel said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. (laughs) That's a brilliant answer. Like when God asks you a question, uh, when you start to wax eloquent and explain to God how the universe ought to work and how he ought to work, it's probably better to just kind of zip it. And just let him talk, but that's not what we do, right? What I want you guys to remember is 
This is the third time that God has done this incredible vision for Ezekiel, and the first time when God appeared to him in chapter one and said, I am God and I'm calling you to be my prophet, rather than Ezekiel being happy about that, we read that he found himself sitting for seven days in bitterness and anger of heart, like, God, you want me to be your prophet? I don't wanna be your prophet. I don't wanna do what you want. The next time we see a vision is in chapter 8 through 11, when God takes him to the temple and shows him that the glory of God is leaving the temple, and Ezekiel falls down on his face and cries out to God, God, are you going to kill everybody? You're not going to leave anybody? In other words, God, your plan is a bad plan. But now God has shown him over and over and over again that God's in charge, and he actually acknowledges it. He says, oh, sovereign Lord. The word sovereign there means Oh, God, who is in charge of everything? And I had to ask myself this question. I had to ask myself, how many times does God have to take me through something to show me that my plan and my way is not best? That God's plan and God's way is always best. And some of us have not learned that lesson. And we keep shaking our fist at God saying, you got it wrong. My life should be going this way. You're letting it go that way. I've decided this and you're taking me in a different direction. And we haven't come to a place where we say, oh, sovereign Lord, you're in charge. Let me listen to you, walk with you. You got something to show me. Ezekiel's gotten to that point. It's taken a while. And so what is God going to do? Look at what happens in verse 4. Then he said to me, so God's speaking, and he says, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and I will bring you, and and, and I will bring you to come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I'll put breath in you and you will come to life and then you will know that I am the Lord. And so Ezekiel's been told to prophesy, so he does it. Look at verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. Now, in your imagination, just think a valley of dry, brittle, clanking bones, and they all start to come together. The feet are assembling, the legs are attached, the hips are coming together, the skeletal structure, the backbone, all 200 plus bones of an adult body, and it's happening over the thousands over the valley. That must have been a roar that's taken place. But it's not just the bones. He says, I looked and tendons, and then the flesh, appeared on them, and then skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. So we go from bones to bodies, but they're not living. What's missing? Verse 9, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Now God does this in two steps, bones to bodies, and then lifeless bodies to living bodies because he wants to show something, first of all to Ezekiel, then to the rest of the nation of Israel and also to us. Do you remember back in the Garden of Eden when God brought life, human life to earth? In Genesis chapter two, verse seven, The passage says, the Lord formed the man out of the dust of the ground. In other words, God took the elements of nature and formed the human body. But then the second step, it says, and God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. In other words, in one of the things I I think are the most beautiful pictures in all of creation, all of history, is when God takes the lifeless body of the human and turns his head up. And God breathes into his nostrils that face-to-face moment. 
God breathes into his nostrils his very life. And that's what animated Adam and the human race. The life of God living with inside this physical body makes up what it means to be human. Now what's so interesting is, is Adam is the first then created in innocence and with Eve immediately following created in innocence and God is communicating to the nation of Israel, I can not only raise you from the dead, but I can raise you in a way that it's like I'm building a new creation, I'm going to make something new out of you. So it's not just giving you life, it's transforming you. Now, the reason why that was so hard, we find in verse 11, so hard for the nation to get, and why God does such a, an incredible job of laying this out, is watch what they're saying. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, and they say, the nation of Israel is saying, they're saying, our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, we are cut off, like we're dead, we're in the grave, there is no hope, we are under the curse of God. At that moment, the living people are scattered to the nations. And it's 580 BC, and Nebuchadnezzar is the world power. He's on the throne. He's the one that destroyed the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. There's nobody on the horizon that looks like they could ever overthrow him. So, how in the world could God ever restore his people? And yet, God gives this promise. Look at verse 12. He says, therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, O oh, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back into the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I've opened your graves and bring you up from them. What's he saying? All the people that are in Babylon in captivity and scattered in the nations are saying, like, it, we're entombed here. We can't get out. We're stuck. We'll never get back to our homeland. It's over for us. The nation of Israel is gone. They're gone forever. They're under the judgment of God. We blew it. And it's too late for us. And God says, no. I'm going to open those graves. I will break down the walls of all the power that's keeping you from going back to your land, and I'll take you back there. And 42 years later, in 538 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire was completely wiped out. A group the Medes and the Persians who came to power and destroyed the city of Babylon and took over the world, they decide to not only send the nation of Israel back home, but to pay for it. And 50,000 people of those that were being prophesied to in exile by Ezekiel, they made the trek back to Israel and reestablished their homeland. That was partial of the fulfillment. But God says he's even going to do more. Look at what he says. In verse 14, he says, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I am the, the Lord have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. What's he saying? He's saying, I'm going to put my spirit in you. I'm making a new covenant with you. I'm going to transform you. I'm going to give you the ability to obey and walk with me. Now, personally, I would just say to you, I don't believe this prophecy has been fulfilled. I believe that we saw a partial fulfillment as the nation of Israel came back after the captivity, but in 135 AD, the Romans scattered them to the nations again. And it wasn't until 1948, if you can believe that, almost 2,000 years went by, and everybody said, there is no way that God can keep his promises. And political Israel was reunited in 1948. But they're not a group of people as a whole that have that heart for God, that are following God. So I believe that there's still something to come a future kingdom that's on the horizon that when God puts his full plan into place, the nation of Israel will play a role in that along with the church and all the Gentiles that have come to faith through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's in our future. That's coming. But here we see that death will not have the final say because God can raise 
the dead. Now, we could stop right here and say, great history lesson. Like, we learned a lot about what happened in the Old Testament. Great history lesson. There's hope. But this is more than a history lesson. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 and 11, so you might want to write this down and go back and look, Paul writes that these things that happened in the past actually were written as examples to us and warnings to us. In other words, we study this, so we look at these things and we see if God could do something then, what could he do now? Which brings us to the question. Second question I want to answer today is, can God resurrect you and me? Can God take the brokenness in our lives and resurrect you and me? And the New Testament gives us insight. So if you'll flip over to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2 in the New Testament, what's interesting is Ephesians chapter 2 parallels Ezekiel 37 almost across the board. Now watch what Paul says about us here in this chapter. He says, as for you, you were dead. Sound familiar? Dry bones? You were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the way of the world and of the rulers of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the craving of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Let me quickly unpack that. Here's what Paul is saying. That all of us were under the curse of death because all of us lived in trespasses and sin. In other words, All of us as a people have walked away from God's plan for us, have created other priorities in our life, and in the process of doing that, we actually now come under the curse, like the nation of Israel did, of denying the charter of our lives that God gave us when he created us and gave us life. In other words, we've broken the covenant with our creator by saying life is about me and doing things our way. And that puts us, like the rest of society, we're not better than anybody else, that puts us all under the curse of God, just like the nation of Israel, under the curse of God. And being under the curse of God means that we have to face God and his justice for what we've done in our lifetime. Now, I know a lot of people don't like that idea that, like, you know, I've done something wrong or I've sinned. We, we want to say things like this. We want to say, well, you know, when I think about me, like, I'm basically a good person. Normally, we say that after we've done something really bad, right? <laughs> but, like, I'm basically a good person. Is that, that kind of how you feel about yourself? Like, God, I'm good with you because I'm basically a good person. Well, let me give you exhibit A. So, exhibit A, a man named Luther Castile on April 13th, 2001, walked into BJ's Pub in El- Elgin, Illinois, with four guns and opened fire. He killed two people and wounded 16 others. At his trial, Castile admitted that he felt unrepentant and no remorse. In fact, when his attorney asked him, do you feel bad about what you did? Here's what he said, quote, any feelings I have in that regard, I'll keep between myself and the Lord. Interesting comment. He also said, as ironic as it sounds, I'm a passionate, giving person. I like to think I'm pretty good. I'm not one to hurt anyone that doesn't provoke me. Ha! I'm a good person as long as everybody does things the way I want them to do it, as long as everybody treats me the way I want to be treated, but you just give me an excuse and get out of the way. What's he saying? He's saying this. He's saying the standard by which I judge whether I'm a good person is completely up to me. 
Because whenever you do something that I think you did wrong, watch out. I got my four guns and I'm coming for you. Now, a lot of you would say, well, that's not really a good person because for many of us, we judge the standard of our goodness based on somebody else. And some of you are thinking, well, yeah, Luther Castile, I'm better than him. I must be a pretty good person, right? Here's the trouble with that. Like, you can be as bad as you want to be because there's always somebody worse. There's always Hitler, right? So when you're judging yourself against other people, you can always find somebody worse. Here's the question. Who's the judge? You see, the judge is God himself. He's the one that determines what's right and wrong and good and evil. And so someday when you stand in his presence, he's not going to ask you how you felt about yourself. He's not going to ask you, were you better than other people? He's going to talk to you about you. That's why it's dangerous to think, I've got this, I've got this, and yet so many of us do. So here's the really cool thing. God has a plan, and I want you to see what God has done for us. Look at what he says in verse 5, verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, these are those Old Testament words, God's loyal love, his deep compassion on people, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. What is he saying? He's saying even when we had blown it, when we were under the curse, when our good deeds were not enough, God did something out of his love and his mercy and his compassion, and that is he offered a way for you not only to have your sins forgiven, but he offered you a future destiny that you would be seated with him in his heavenly realms, at the table, at the feast, in the kingdom, in the presence of God. Your destiny would be God's heaven. And how does that happen? How do you get that? Verse 8, he says, For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. This does not come from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, pause for a minute. Exhibit B, all of you in the room who believe you're good people, like I'm a good person, I'm going to live my life in such a way that I prove that I'm a good person. What's the motivation behind that? It's a little word called pride, which in and of itself is the heart of sin. Look what I can do. Look how good I am. Look how better I am than everybody else. Actually, in the process of trying to be good, we often find ourselves in a position of boasting about it. And that's not how this works. You don't have to get better. All you have to be is transformed by Jesus. And here's what Jesus did. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world, lived a perfect life, so you don't have to live a perfect life. God sent his son into the world, Jesus Christ, who actually took the punishment for sin, died on a cross, the, the most cruel way to die. He took the punishment for all the sins that we've committed. And all God says is, this is a gracious thing I'm offering you. This is a free gift, and all you have to do is have faith. All you have to do is believe. In other words, for you to simply be able to say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I violated your laws, and yet I know that you sent your son to pay for my sins. I believe, Jesus, that you died for me. I want you to forgive me and to come into my life and transform me. And God says that anybody who calls upon the name of Jesus 
asking for forgiveness and eternal life. You're saved. Your destiny is secure. Death will not have the final say in your life because God can raise the dead and the promise is he'll raise you. And it doesn't just stop there. He goes on in verse 10 to talk about how God then gives you life to live. He says in verse 10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, then God gives you out of the blessing of salvation, he gives you a life plan to be a blessing to other people. Like Joel, that we saw his story today, turning around and being a blessing, that's how God raises you up. It's not just your eternal destiny, but it's actually changing your destiny right now. And so, on Friday, I get an email from my son, and he's sending me a copy of an email that he got from the chairman of the Department of Computer Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he graduated from. And here's what the guy says as he sends this out to like all of the graduates of computer science at the University of North Carolina. The chairman writes, Dear friends, it is with great sadness that I must share the following update on the health of the department founder, Dr. Frederick P. Brooks, Jr. I know how much Dr. Brooks has meant to the department, to computer graphics, to the world of computing, and to each of you, so I wanted to reach out and pass on the following message from his son, Roger Brooks, and then he copies his son's message. Now, before we get to that, let me just pause. Some of you are saying, I don't know Fred Brooks from Adam, but you benefit from him every day because this was one of those computer genius guys that literally changed the face of computing. In fact, his impact is so profound that he's got a law named after him. You may have learned it in management, Brooks Law. In addition to that, he actually coined the term computer architecture. Like, he's the guy who figured out much of what's happening and built teams along with Tom Watson, the founder of IBM, built teams that have literally changed the world. And so, actually, this didn't just go out to the people in the, at the University of North Carolina graduates, but it actually went out to Hacker News. How many of you all follow Hacker News? Okay, if you find somebody raising their hand, that's a legitimate geek. <laughs> this is, this is a, a site for um, people who are developers to get on and talk about different things. And so this went out and was posted there for people all around the world that develop software to follow this guy. So here's what his son wrote. His son wrote, Dear ones, as you have heard, on Saturday my father came home from the hospital in hospice care. He spent most of his time sleeping when slightly awake. He's only slightly responsive and not able to respond verbally to questions. He seems to be in no pain or no particular discomfort. He's eating and drinking small amounts, but far from enough. And then his son does not name a single important contribution to computing. Oh, much more important, his son says. Frederick P. Brooks Jr. has fought the good fight, run the good race, been an outstanding husband and father and mentor and a friend of many, and now is fading. His hope and his joy, coming joy in death and in life, is in his Lord Jesus Christ, who I know will welcome him with well done. You see, at the end of the day, nothing you accomplish in the rat race that you call living will matter. Here's what did matter. Throughout his life, he constantly pointed people to Jesus. He'd have a session 
where he was working with a group of engineers or teaching a class of students, and he would be saying, now we need to outline all the big questions, and after outlining all the big questions related to technology, he'd say, and now we need to talk about the bigger question. And the bigger question is, what are you going to do with Jesus Christ? We have people in our church that were doing their PhD under him that came to faith because of his influence on them. His whole life was more than simply making a contribution to technology. It was about making an impact so people could understand and know the resurrection power that comes in Jesus Christ. And he dedicated his life to that. And his son wraps up the email with this. He says, Corey Roberts, Robbins, associate pastor at Orange United Methodist Church, visited yesterday and prayed what I thought was the exact appropriate loving and merciful prayer. And here's what she prayed over Fred. O oh God, our Father, O oh Christ, our brother, O oh Spirit, our comforter, Fred is ready. Now meet him at this mortal threshold and deliver him to that eternal city to your radiant splendor, to your table and the feast and festival of friends, to the wonder and the welcome of his heart's true home. But he waits for your word. Bid him rise and follow, and he will follow you gladly into the deeper glory. O Spirit, his true shepherd. O Christ, his true king. O God, his true and loving father. Receive him now and forgive his sins through the blood of his Savior, Jesus Christ. My friends, what I deeply desire for you this Thanksgiving is that you would have the confidence that when you stand in the presence of God at the end of your life, that you would be able to stand before God knowing that you have been forgiven because you put your faith in Jesus and what he did for you. And you'd have the confidence that you're welcomed into his eternal paradise. And with that, you bring the good works that God called you to do as you put your trust in Jesus. The worst thing would be to be standing in the presence of God, stammering over the excuses that you made for why you left this offer of eternal life and forgiveness that cost his son his death and suffering, and you just let that go because it's too hard to believe or because I can't get around to thinking about this or because I've got other things to do. Like the worst thing ever, is to be stammering around before God trying to explain to him why you walked away from the opportunity to know God through Jesus Christ and you left this incredible gift unopened. My prayer for you this Thanksgiving is that you would be able to celebrate that in this life and in the life to come, you have forgiveness, you have resurrection, you have hope, and no matter how bad your week is going or your year is going or your life is going, you've got the greatest thing of all to celebrate. And for those of you who know you have that, but you've lost sight of it, my prayer for you today is that you would not leave here until you spent a few moments repenting of the distractions and coming back to your first love. Today is the opportunity for you to put your faith in Jesus to renew your confidence in him, and to go into this thanksgiving knowing all is well because God is the one who can raise the dead. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, I just thank you that in a world that's hopeless, there is hope, and that hope comes from you. And I pray today that no one will walk away from the joy and the glory of a resurrection in Jesus Christ. Father, may that be true in every heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.